we're really talking about three different conscientious objectors here. My father, Roderick Clark, my father-in-law, Albert Lawrence, and myself. Um, I was again affected by the conscription after the Second World War. It was interesting that prior to the First World War, the government several times tried to bring in conscription, but it failed in Parliament. And it wasn't until two years of the First World War and the enormous casualties that had been suffered that a conscription act was brought in and provided at the result of, I think, quite a lot of pressure from several Quaker MPs in the allowance of conscientious objection and this tribunal system which was set up. We'll deal with my father-in-law first because I know very little about what happened to him. He was working for his father who was a grocer in Thaxted and I think he had his tribunal in Bury St Edmunds and accepted the idea of alternative service on the land and worked on a farm. Although the one time I talked to him about, he said he did come to the Quaker meeting once in Brixton. Now that's not very agricultural even in 1914. <laughs> but my Mother's parents at that time were the wardens of Brixton Meeting House and I'll have to look up their records to see if he is mentioned in any visitor's book from that time. He served, I suppose, about two years on a farm and I don't know what conditions he was under. My father was working as an export merchant getting orders from people overseas, shipping stuff overseas, and he reckoned that he could earn enough money to keep him. He was living with his parents, but not married at that time, um, for about eight hours week, work a week. And he devoted virtually all the rest of his time to voluntary work of one sort and the other. Particularly, he was involved in training people for the Quaker Relief Service who were going off to work in France and Belgium right from early days as well as the FAU. There was a Quaker Relief Service. They organised additional farm machinery for land that had been conquered by the Germans and then recovered by the French army in western France. They set up a maternity hospital which was staffed by Quakers for about four years from about 1916, 17 through till it was rebuilt by the American Quakers and handed over to the French government. They also did a lot of work with Belgian people who had been displaced by the German invasion of Belgium at the beginning of the First War either to northern France or quite a lot of them into Holland and Quakers worked to help them. Another thing that Quakers were doing was helping the very many Germans who had settled in this country and when the war came there was an absolute outcry against them. Shops were smashed and goodness knows what else and Quakers helped quite a lot of them to get back to Germany travelling through Holland to the German border and Quakers and others in Germany helped English people who were caught in the same way in Germany to get back to England early on in the First World War. <coughs> Eventually, my father was taken up by the police as evading the Conscription Act, brought before a tribunal, and initially he was given absolute exemption. But very, very few survived with that exemption. That would have enabled him to go on doing his relief work and other things. Instead, the appeal tribunal 
at the army's instigation, and the army was always represented on tribunals, rescinded that and said, find yourself alternative work acceptable to the tribunal. And the government and the tribunals said that work must support the war effort. And he spent about six months suggesting things he might do, and the tribunal said no, no, no. So he became an absolutist. And I think this was the fate of most people who were absolutists. They started off successfully, but then were told, no, do alternative service, and they just wouldn't. So he too was eventually taken by the police, fined for des deserting because he was deemed to be in the army under the Conscription Act. The police fined him, handed him over to the army. Now I've got a lovely letter where from the sergeant in charge of one of the barracks where he was handed over, who said, if your father, well, if Mr. Clark and Mr. Mannell, who was a cousin of his, who was arrested at the same time, if there were lots of people like that, there wouldn't be any war. <laughs> that was a man who'd been serving on the army on the front. So there was a great deal of respect for conscientious objectors about those who knew them. And I, my father had several testimonial letters before tri for his tribunals from serving officers in the army. At any rate, the army court-martialed him because he wouldn't put on his uniform, as we've heard, and said to sentence him to prison. Unfortunately, he hadn't brought the record because he was let out four times and five times, re-arrested, court-martialed again and sentenced again. And eventually he spent two and a half years in prison, mostly at Maidstone Jail. He was short time at Wormwood Scrubs, where I heard it jokingly said there was the largest Quaker meeting in England. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that they ever managed to meet as a meeting for worship, but they may have kept silence in their cells. Eventually he was let out in um, April 1919, some people were kept even longer, I discovered listening to the statements in London today. But most people were out by April 1919. So they kept them in after the end of the war, I suppose, because they couldn't demob all the soldiers at that time. And that was, I suppose, a fair enough treatment. My mother always believed that his health had been damaged by his time in prison because he died when I was seven, so I never really had a chance to talk with him about his experiences. I have, however, got all his notes of the statements he made at tribunals and a great deal of press coverage. He was a great writer to the Friend and other newspapers about pacifism. and. I've got a great deal of that material that's come down to me. Um, the final thing. At the end of his papers I found his discharge from the army. <laughs> and counter stamped in red across this handwritten form is a statement to say that if this man ever tries to enlist in the army he will be sent to prison. <laughs> I think that's about the end. <laughs> oh, I should say that I was a conscientious yes, objector myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have forgotten that bit because it was really all too simple. Like Richard, I was at the Quaker School Bootham in York and I remember one Easter holidays having received my call-up papers because I had just turned 18, writing a statement as to why I was a conscientious objector, saying that I believed to kill a fellow human being was wrong, that I believed this was contrary to the 
message of Christ, but that as there wasn't a war going on, I didn't see any reason why I shouldn't do alternative service. Come the summer term I took my A-levels, or the equivalent, and set off on a bicycle to go to yearly meeting which for that year was held in York. That's the annual Quaker gathering of friends. And in those days there weren't mobile phones or anything, so when a letter came calling me to a tribunal in Bristol, my mother had to write back and say, sorry, he's left school, gone to cycle to Edinburgh, where he's attending yearly meeting as a representative of street meeting, and I don't know how to get in touch with him. <laughs> So, I don't know whether they wrote back, but eventually, through the post, came a letter saying he's been granted exemption on condition that he does relief work, or farm work, or forestry, and various other options. Now, at that time, the FAU was just reforming after the war time and getting into this post-war service that Richard and Malcolm mentioned. So I opted to do farm work and we cast around and discovered we knew of a farmer and we got in touch with him and he said, well, I know another chap, I think he might be interested in having somebody to work for him. So I got him a bicycle, went down, I suppose I phoned him up first, um, and met him on the lawn on what is now a caravan dealers in Highbridge in central Somerset and he said yes I'll take you on and the first thing we did was move farm which was quite interesting <laughs> I'd never had anything to do with farming although I'd lived during the war in the country because before that we lived in London moving farm driving 30 cattle down the A38 before there was a motorway <laughs> was quite an interesting experience. But it was a very good way of learning what all the farm things were that we moved. And I spent two years with this farm, farmer and his family. Tragically, his eldest son had been killed whilst attending agricultural college in Devon in a shooting accident his second son and I think it was partly for the benefit of his second son that I was taken on as a possible companion and they treated me very well and although father had been in the Somerset Yeomanry during the First World War and presumably had a pretty tough time they treated me extremely well and I was welcomed into that family without any prejudice against being a pacifist. They did ask me what would I do, and I said, well, I have to trust that I would act up to my convictions. One could never say. Thank you very much.